Welcome to the 52nd episode of the New Ventures podcast. I'm your host, Sanjoy Sanyal, the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique climate finance firm, and a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judge Business School. I host the New Ventures podcast to help people start climate initiatives, learn from others who are already progressed in their paths. Today is a special day, as I have a co-host, Raven McMenemy, and Raven will introduce herself and our guest for today. Thank you, Sanjoy, for the opportunity to co-host with you. It's great to be here. I'm Raven, and I'm a consultant at Eden Smith Group, a niche data specialist in staffing, consultancy, and education. And I recruit experts in data science and machine learning for the US market. And today, we have Michael Poisson as our guest, who is the Managing Director of North America at Ideal Ratings. So thank you for joining us today, Michael. Raven, thank you very much for having me. And Sanjoy, it's a pleasure to be on your podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Michael, you long worked for companies that provide data to the financial industry. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yes, I've been in fintech for my entire career, my entire working career. Right out of college, I joined a software technology company to help CFOs manage all the financial transactions of a large Fortune 500 company. And I transitioned from that company after we were acquired by a public company into the alternative investment space, again, focusing on data and risk management solutions. Transitioning once again after another acquisition into the pure risk space, where we're selling to hedge fund managers and endowments and foundations. And after that was acquired a third time, I found myself without a job. At the time, you know, it was, it was actually a blessing in disguise and that my mom was suffering with cancer and on her final days and it gave me the opportunity to be a caretaker. And it gave me an opportunity to reflect on my life and hers. And I realized that I wanted to do something a bit more meaningful in leveraging my experience in fintech. So I actually found a friend of mine that specialized in responsible investment solutions and data. So I joined Ideal Ratings almost 10 years ago. And we focus here on doing pure research and data for responsible investing. So some know it as ESG, environment, social, and governance, screening and analysis. Others are more faith-based investors that are looking for you know, negative screens to fulfill their obligations in terms of their investment protocols. But this is the space that I've never felt more welcome and feeling like I'm making a major contribution that's very fulfilling as well. That was excellent. So thank you very much for, for giving us a little bit of insight there. And so, so what was it that really prompted you into joining Ideal Ratings specifically? Yeah, it was the sense of combining doing something to leverage my years of, of fintech, sales, building organizations, and service. You know, a subject matter that is on the rise around the world globally, and people are looking to assess and evaluate investment opportunities with a lens of responsibility. So it kind of was the best of both worlds at the time and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it uh, ever since being in this space. And now I've been you know, so involved and passionate about it that I decided to write a book, which was released uh, last March called The ESG Data Revolution, Sustainable Fuel for Tomorrow's Businesses. So this is my opportunity to share what I've learned in the industry and uh, to continue to have the conversation with others uh, about the space. Michael, it's great, obviously, to have you as a company executive and, a, and an author uh, on the podcast. And I'm going to ask you, you know, there's a whole industry, as you've been a part of that, supplying various data to the financial organizations. Now, why do you need a new company to offer ESG ratings? I mean, could not existing companies, the type you worked for, could have done it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because there are today over 150 individual research and data companies out there, some of which I'd say many of which transformed into ratings and scoring companies as well. There's lots and lots of data out there, but there's no one specific consensus as to what is the proper way to come up with a rating or score. So of these, let's say 150 companies out there doing the research and data, now, some of them specialize in carbon data or diversity data or water data. So again, people are finding their own niche and specialty. But it's really been a wild west. And ESG data, if you will, has been around for over 40, 50 years. But since there is no kind of regulatory body saying what's important and what isn't yet, it's again, there's just such a demand 
And there's uh, people trying to find their proper space in terms of what they feel is important to the industry. So would it be possible for you to, for example, break the industry up into a few buckets and explain the types of players? For example, there are people who give ESG ratings for public companies. There are others who do it for private companies. Can you give us a little bit of an overview that way? Sure. I like to look at, first and foremost, what type of research are they doing? I've got two primary kind of camps, if you will. What I call the traditional researchers, like the MSCIs and Sustainalytics and my company, Investor Ideal Ratings, we look at published information via companies, their own transparency, their sustainability reports, what they put out there in the public domain. And we start there. What is the company reporting on themselves? And then we go, we start going a little bit broader from there. So one approach, what I call the traditional research methodology is on all available public information on these companies. An emerging approach, a newer approach would be using artificial intelligence and NLP, natural language processing, where they may be purely basing their research on algorithms, looking for keywords, looking for specific algorithms to be filled out in terms of deriving carbon information or water usage information or diversity information. So the traditional approach versus the artificial intelligence approach. Today, we're seeing a little bit of a merging of that. I don't believe personally that one is necessarily better than the other. I think one should be acknowledge that the other augments whatever you, you have to begin with. But there are some regulations that are finally coming into action, primarily in Europe. And it's an alphabet soup of regulations out there. There's this thing called SFDR out of Europe. There's EU taxonomy out of Europe. There's TCFD out of Europe. There's the SEC is doing uh, some deliberation on their new requirements. But this alphabet soup of regulation is starting to tell us specifically what the regulators are asking for. And, and in doing so, some of the data that they're asking for isn't necessarily reported and isn't necessarily derived through artificial intelligence. So everybody's going back into the laboratories, refining their models to come up with if not AI, estimation tools to come up with a set of data that uh, specifically the regulators are looking for. So again, in my definitions, two broad categories of traditional research versus more modern techniques, I'll, I'll call it that. But within that, again, you have certain topics to be covered, such as the E, the S, and the G. So there are specialists that do focus on the environment and water and sustainable environment issues. There are people that uh, focus on the S and human rights and labor and equality. There are even people that look at the G and the governance aspects and, uh, and what companies' commitments are and how that's woven into the performance of a company based on senior management's commitment to these types of topics. So hopefully that gives you a landscape of, in terms of my views of, of what's out there for ESG research. Thanks, Michael. So given all of that information, I mean, could you tell us a little bit about the demand for your products in the North America area? Sure. It's interesting. We as an ESG data provider didn't start out that way, Ideal Ratings. 16 years ago, we more focused on responsible investing, faith-based investing, very specifically Islamic investors that needed really tough screens to comply with Sharia law. So as we became a bit successful in the Middle East and Asia for our Sharia screening, we were introduced to other faiths. Then we were introduced to the concept of, hey, you're not very far off from this broader category of ESG, which is not just exclusions, but also inclusive data, such as companies that have a positive impact or companies that have a positive result that need to be screened for ESG purposes. So that said, we were one of the later entries into North America. North America actually has been a global laggard behind Europe when it comes to ESG investing and ESG awareness, if you will. We're, we're getting there. But as demand is picking up, our timing is good providing our ESG data services for the past five years or so. And it's only getting more interesting. So as the regulators tell us what's important, and as more U.S. American companies get interested in the topic, and again, as the regulators are enforcing their, their rules and, and submissions and compliance, we're getting a whole bunch of new, what I'll call reluctant participants, people who didn't care about this stuff, who overnight have to, be, have to care about this stuff. And they're developing their own opinions and their own questions. So I only see the market as growing, not only in demand, 
but in interesting new areas that maybe haven't yet been discussed. Uh, it's obviously interesting to hear that you came into the North American market from completely another market. In the two buckets that you defined, the more traditional research methodology companies and the new AI machine learning driven companies, you know, in which bucket do you fall under? What types of data and metrics do you use? Yeah, Ideal Rating specifically focuses on or starts with publicly reported information and data. So we go into companies' sustainability reports, we go into their press releases, we go into letters to shareholders, we go into publicly released information first. But as I mentioned earlier, the demands uh, by the regulators for particular metric data, quantitative data, have required us to build out more estimation models and analytical tools which look at industry information, look at peer group analysis, look at general information to make best estimates on behalf of each individual company that we cover. And we cover a large universe of companies, by the way, 40,000 public companies globally is our universe, which by comparison to some other data vendors is, is quite large. But to cover that many companies, supplementing our manual rigorous research in the first type, as I mentioned, traditional research, with models uh, has certainly helped. Great. You actually were preaching, you, you are merging these two approaches in, in some way or the other. Publicly available data to a certain extent, I can understand, but to use data that is not published, could you give us insight into where that comes from? How do you get access to it, in other words? Yeah. Before I go there, keep in mind that publicly available information is or potentially can be as dangerous as derived information. You know, we're all been abundantly made aware of greenwashing. And I understand the most current term these days is rainbow washing, because if you look at the UN objectives, every initiative is broken up by a different color. But uh, are companies, you know, reporting a, an actual statistic or are they reporting something that's considered a marketing statistic or uh, making a marketing statement? So a lot of this, this data, and even though it's publicly released, is in question or suspect. Until such a point when we've got you know, more audit and assurance, even this publicly released information might be uh, at risk, if you will. But back to your original question, estimation models are all based on what similar types of companies are reporting. So if our target company is not necessarily reporting a very specific metric on water usage or carbon emission, so one, two, and three, we may be able to use similar types of companies in similar types of industries with similar type of geographic exposure, again, all built into a mathematical formula to project what we best expect this company's exposure to that particular metric to be. That's an example of uh, estimation models and, and a derived statistic on a particular metric that we're looking into. So it's always great to hear about real world examples, Michael. So um, would you be able to give us a, you know, a story or two um, and some insight into how your data and your services help the client, you know, in practice? Absolutely. Ideal Ratings serves hundreds of clients globally, but we serve, if you look at our clients and then the way they serve their clients, we actually serve thousands of end users uh, globally. What we found is that uh, at the end of the day, Ideal Ratings isn't a solutions provider. We're purely a research and data business uh, that provides solutions or provides data to solutions providers. So if you look at one end of the spectrum, my big giant clients would be the large custody banks like State Street, JP Morgan, Northern Trust, and the like. And they take our data to come up with solutions for their custodial clients for doing their ESG screening, their compliance, and their regulatory reporting. If I take a step from the large custody banks into large asset managers, we have some top 10 global hedge funds that are actually using our ESG and ethical investing data to screen their portfolios to either come up with their own strategies in, in and around ESG and sustainable strategies to taking maybe a flagship product and coming up with an ESG highly rated version of their flagship product. So if they have a, a large investor that like what the hedge fund is doing, but they want to tweak it a little bit to have a you know, more sustainable returns, they can do that as well. 
all the way down to the individual RIA, which is an investment advisor. And you know, I've got one client who's managing less than $100 million of private wealth money. But the, the families that this person works for have very strict guidelines on what they can and can't invest in. So it could be as simple as no guns, alcohol, or tobacco, or it could be something a little bit more complex, but they rely on our data to do the filtering and screening and the regular maintenance of those portfolios to make sure they comply with their general guidelines and guidance. So Michael, uh, one thing I wanted to go back on is that you talked a little bit about the alphabet soup. Now, TCFD, which is, of course, the climate disclosures practice coming out of Europe, that's more in the E category, right, the environmental category. The others, maybe for our audience, could you just help them understand what the others are trying to do? Yeah, I mean, they are all in the environment social governance spectrum, if you will, just a little side story. You know, I thought I was being clever when I first set out to write my book. Uh, the original working title was ABCDESG. I own that website. So, and my, my publisher thought that maybe you want to be a little bit tighter in that title, but I am primed to write my children's book for environmental consumption. Anyhow, most of the regulations in the US, the SEC's focus has been on uh, specifically on greenwashing. And, and they actually started with uh, the naming of funds to ensure that the naming of certain investment vehicles were consistent with their ultimate implementation so that people weren't buying something just based on the name of the product. But in the SFDR, which is the Sustainable Directive Financial Regulation, again, we're taking into a very specific set of characteristics, which include things like doing no harm as one of the, the central themes or objectives of the particular category investment. So Investment managers, again, if they're advertising that they're investing in a certain way, they're going to be required to, to prove that to the regulators through the constituents of the portfolios that they're investing in. And they could be, again, uh, subject to regulation or fine. What they're advertising uh, is inconsistent with the contents of the actual portfolio. It demystifies some of these alphabet soup to a certain extent. I love that the ABCD of ESG, the book could have been named that way. As a pitch for your book, if you may, for our audience, what more will they learn if they read the book? Well, you know what? I'm going to ask Raven because she told, she just sent me a, a message after reading my book. So this is going to be a real test for this interview. Rather than me answer that question, let me ask Raven answer that question for you. Thank you, Michael. Really put me on the spot there. But yes, I mean, the book was really insightful, especially for somebody who's just starting out, um, you know, wanting to get more into ESG and into climate. So it was extremely easy to follow. But it's really in terms of the the kind of information that's in there, being able to see it from from a perspective of somebody who's actively in the industry and what kind of trends there are um, in the industry and kind of a projection for what it will look like in the future. Um, but also, I really enjoyed that you used real world examples with some of your clients as to, you know, how you're helping them and what their views on the current kind of ESG market is as well. So it's very, very well written and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think the uh, real world examples would be probably the most interesting part of the book, right? I was very grateful to have a couple of our existing Ideal Ratings clients contribute, as well as a good friend who's a, an asset manager right the forward. But thank you for that, Raven. I think her review is as long as the book itself, so it's a very short read. But again, the focus was trying to, to talk about some of the businesses that are emerging out of the data. So we started with data 40, 50, 60 years ago. That data people were starting to use as some type of benchmark or an index. And once you have an index, you have the ability to create investable product like an ETF. One area of the book is just talking about people are creating financial products out of this stuff. Another aspect of the book was just the jobs that are being created uh, and you know, even starting with you know, education. So today I can't conceive of any, even you know, community college that doesn't have one offering for a sustainability course, uh, but there's whole complete majors and doctorates and masters um, in sustainability and responsible investing in, in the entire topic. So the tens of thousands of jobs that are creating that are looking for at least some exposure or experience to the topic is re very relevant and interesting. 
plenty of examples of how the world is taking advantage of this stuff. I'm going to ask the question actually on behalf of Raven. Uh, Raven, this is going to be a favorite. She's in, into data and AI, and you have already talked about this, Michael, but I'm trying to speculate the use of data and AI in, the, in your entire work. So it's obviously going to be extracting of information from public sources, creating the models. Where all does this use of these technologies come in? Well, let me give you a, a crazy example. I was at a, uh, a symposium at Yale last fall uh, where a number of white papers or college papers were being presented. And one very specifically was on the use of AI in this particular field. And the very, very narrow focus was they were using artificial intelligence to listen in on quarterly earnings calls to listen for environmental statements, which included the intonation of the language used by the CFO during the call and the CEO during the call. So, I mean, just to give you an example of how specific these models can be for one particular data element, highly focused on one element of the E, it's remarkable. And to take that, and I'm sure there's more than a couple of lines of code that went into developing that particular model for that particular use case. Now extrapolate it beyond that use to the rest of E, and then extrapolate it to S and G, and then extrapolate it to other things that are common in this particular industry and space. You know, it really blows the mind in terms of you know what we've got ahead of us. Again, I am just amazed every day at the new things people are developing, but we've got a very big task ahead of us, and I think a long journey to to get there. My mind boggles. I, I can't imagine myself to a CFO, but I'm imagining myself to listening into a CFO's call and his voice drops when he, he's talking about emission reduction or something. And you know, the software is smart enough to pick up that he's not quite confident about those assertions. Yes. Yeah, so again, I can only imagine you know, what the next use case for this particular group of scientists is going to address next. I, I don't know. Given the, the potential and the rapid growth and advancement in this area, I mean, what kind of skills do you look for when it comes to hiring into ideal ratings? Now, that's a great question. And it's interesting that, as I mentioned, colleges and universities are offering you know, basic courses on the topic in general. They're offering pure total curriculums in terms of uh, getting a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD in sustainability or some other application in responsible investment or corporate social responsibility. So it may start with you know, a basic understanding of and, and feeling for, does this stuff even matter or make sense to you? Most of the research out there is done on large public companies. And one of the things I talk about in the book was the many solutions providers believe that the holy grail of this industry is found in who can come up with the biggest and best solution for private companies. So rather than the Fortune 5000 or the FTX 1000, we're talking about millions of private companies all the way down to the mom and pop shops. What does sustainability mean or what does ESG mean to the average business all the way down to the small company level? And I'm, I'm going there because it could be as simple as you know 10 questions to be answered or 50 questions to be answered in terms of are they conscious that this is an issue? their treatment of people, whether they're creating products and services that are harmful, not only to the environment, but to people, et cetera, et cetera. So if we can come up with some generalized approach to assess everyone's pulse, their simple health check, like temperature, blood pressure, pulse, to understand their health in this particular subject matter, that's where when we transition into hiring people, even at ideal ratings, it's a general understanding of what the topic is and a general feelings as towards their personal feelings towards the subject matter is the starting point. Then it gets into very specific knowledge in terms of your ability to research or code or sell or support, et cetera. But I think it does start with some fundamental questions with respect to, are you the right fit for this industry? Are you the right fit for this company? And then we build the skills on top of that. I'm quite uh, surprised that you mentioned the cultural aspects first and not the technological aspects. Um, I mean, you said that as on top of the cultural aspects, but the cultural aspects where you know I'm hearing you right is the predominant factor. In my particular company, that happens to be the case. 
We do walk the walk, we talk the talk. It is a general feeling movement that we are all, all working for a common cause in my particular company. I don't necessarily, I'm not representing the industry. At the end of the day, we all still need to make money to sustain the business financially, but ideal ratings and its approach to the topic and our service offerings or product offerings, I should say, we start there with the culture. And Raven asked you earlier about uh, examples of your application with your clients, which is you know, looking outward. What's typical day like enough? I suspect there are AI engineers. I suspect there are financial analysts. How do you sort of manage these teams? Yeah, it's a good question. And we are so dispersed. The CEO sits in San Francisco, California. I'm sitting in Long Island, uh, New York. Our research center is based in Cairo, Egypt. We have salespeople in Malaysia and in the Middle East. So we are a very diversified organization and there's somebody working, you know, 24 hours a day. The groups themselves are split into kind of uh, ESG uh, research in one capacity. We have Islamic faith, another faith-based uh, research group. We have a group of engineers that uh, are responsible for our technical platform for delivery of this data. And we have a you know client uh, client success group which are responsible for. And I'm constantly amazed again with the time differences that whenever any of my clients in North America submit uh, an inquiry day or night within 15 minutes, somebody has responded that we've received your question uh, with a tangible. This is our understanding of your question, and uh, here's the answer. Or we'll be back to you shortly as soon as we can find you an answer. We are compartmentalized in terms of function research versus software engineering and delivery is kind of its own group and client success is responsible for understanding the whole picture and delivering a quality product to our clients. And we have come to the end of the podcast. You turn the tables and ask you, do you have questions for me and Raven? Why are you interested in this topic is my first question. So, I mean, for me personally, having an interest in it is it's being able to contribute to a, a good cause and really having a you know an impact on on change and making sure that regulations are being adhered to and that the right regulations are being put in place as well it's like something that i've grown up with so in my background i have a lot of um, climate research that i've been exposed to and it's just something that's that's always been at the forefront of my mind so as i'm transitioning into my data science journey it's my main area of focus to see how I can leave my mark on that industry and, and be able to contribute to change. And Sanjo, in, in America, at least, this is becoming a very hot topic. And what I mean by hot is uh, politically charged. It's being weaponized. I'm not sure you know, about the rest of the world, but are you afraid of this subject? Well, first of all, I think we should be all afraid in some ways of the potential impact of climate change in all our lives, whether you're in the North America or you're in Africa. To me, the interest is uh, comes from the fact that I do work with clients who are investing climate money. Their ability to assess and interpret climate data from various sources and make decisions is important. I'm particularly interested, which is why I'm trying to partner with Raven on, on these podcasts that of the use of artificial intelligence in making the data accessible because and, and the requirement of data analysis is so large. You know, you need tools for doing that. On the political issue, I think there is no doubt in my mind, just the way it is in the United States, things have been weaponized. And I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I do believe that there will be a pushback on ESG as paradoxically, when the impact of climate change become more apparent. So, for example, when there is an issue around food security, for example, there will be pressure to actually disregard environmental norms and pull in ecological land for, for agriculture. So is that the time that we have to have tools like yours ready? Sandra, what do you hope your audience would take away from this short session we had today? What I'm hoping the audience will take away is, A, that there's a serious company you know, doing this. Therefore, the, the political stuff that you hear, that this doesn't make sense, that this is uh, too complicated, that there is a 
count a story around this. And there's a company I, I can work with, which has a software tool, which is looking at it seriously, you know, the largest database of public companies in the world, Not, nothing to be scoffed at. So that's what I want the audience to react. That's awesome. If people have to get in touch with you and also read your book, how should they? Well, Ideal Ratings is, the website is just that, www.idealratings.com. If you want to email me personally, it's mpoisson at idealratings.com. The book, again, is entitled The ESG Data Revolution, Sustainable Fuel for Tomorrow's Businesses. There is a, a website, the ESGDataRevolution.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn and uh, plenty of ways to get in contact that way. With that, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, of course. So thank you ever so much, Michael, for, for coming on the show. It's been great to have you on and thank you for being my first guest as co-host. Uh, it's been really interesting to learn a bit more about you and your background and, and what you're doing over at Ideal Ratings.